If you have your Bibles this evening, why don't you turn with me to the book of Matthew. We've been in the book of Matthew for some time now, and we're only going to be going through two verses. It's going to be in chapter 1, starting in verse 20, and we will be going through verse 21. During our time in the book of Matthew in December, we have been answering questions. We talked about this Jesus and who does he come from? And we talked about his ancestors and what made him so prolific from a human perspective. Then we talked about Joseph and him asking the question, uh, what am I supposed to do? And going through all the anxieties that he would have had with uh, Jesus and Mary being pregnant and having to adopt Jesus as his son and into the line of David. And then we talked about the Magi, and, and we answered the question, how did they get here? <laughs> Some uh, people who were completely far away from the Jewish faith, but God, through his natural creation and his supernatural acts, brought them to discover the Savior of the world, pre previewing a time where you and I, non-Jewish people, would be able to worship God in spirit and in truth. And today's question, ladies and gentlemen, is why does he, why did he really come? Christmas time is a time that is very different in modern day society uh, we start the Christmas music sometime in September or October, for those who are a little crazy. <laughs> uh, some people, like my mother-in-law, have Christmas music going on all year, so I love being able to sing Jesus, Lover of My Soul, while also singing Green Sleeves right after it. Gets a little awkward sometimes in the middle of February, but we'll get there and adjust. But Christmas sometimes has been a time of consumerism. I was reading an, uh, a news article today that we in America will spend $300 million on Christmas gifts alone. And it's about the ornaments, and it's about cutting down the tree and the traditions that we made. And there's nothing wrong with those things. But it's not why he really came. And that is what we are going to get into this evening. Starting in the middle of verse 20, the angel is speaking to Joseph, and this is that reason. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. The Bible is one unified story that leads to Jesus Christ. In the beginning of creation, we see how God creates a perfect world in seven days. And in those seven days, he creates form, function, and family. A perfect community where he can be able to have relationship with his greatest creation, mankind. One who is carved in his image. But man has a problem. After the first week, we thought that things were going great. But because we as mankind are made with a choice to be able to love ourselves and our agenda or to love God and his ways and his rules, we left our perfection and our communion with God in order to do what's right in our own eyes. And in this unified story, the Bible starts going back and forth about people that God uses as a portion or as an image of what would be perfected in a child. We see people like Abraham and how he shows us great faith and how through his amazing faith, 
he would say, from you will come a seed that will bless the entire nation. From there, we see a preview of King David and how he would reign priestly. He would love God, love his word, but also rule with an authority unlike anyone anyone has ever seen and known. We see people as wise as Solomon. We see people as great as King Josiah. But they are all forerunners or shadows of what would be completed in a child. Because you see, those great men and those great women in Scripture could only do so much because being man, they were imperfect. And we see throughout the entire narrative of Scripture that whenever something needs to be perfected, God doesn't say, I'll use this person. God says, I'll do it myself and come alongside you so that you can be complete. We look at Abraham's story again. When he tells Abraham about the seed that will bless the nations, he has a covenant with Abraham where he makes a sacrifice. The animals are cut in two. And in Jewish custom, both people would walk through that line of animals and make the vow and say, if I cannot fulfill my side of the promise, may I be like these halves of these animals. God, when he puts Abraham to sleep, makes him immobile and walks through himself because he knows that he will accomplish what Abraham couldn't. So now we go years and years, thousands upon years away from Abraham's story. And we need God now to start it so that we can be able to come alongside him and follow that example. And he reveals his plan to Joseph in a dream. His name is Jesus Christ, and he is fully God and fully man. God doesn't go and do what demigods did in mythology and lay with a woman. No, by the Holy Spirit, he fills that womb. And his DNA is in there. And the DNA of man is in there. So now you have the supernatural being who created this world is forming himself the same way that we would. 46 chromosomes. He'll coo like we do. He is knit like we were knit. How crazy to think, and I saw this earlier on Instagram, that the person who knit together Mary in her mother's womb was knitting himself in hers. He is fully God, and he is fully man. That means he knows our emotions. He knows what it means to have anxiety and go through the dark hours. He knows what hyperventilation is when he's at the peak of his final breath. He understands our burdens and every temptation that we go through, and yet he proved himself faithful to give us an example of what would be ahead. But he wasn't a grown man. He didn't start as a grown man. He started as a child. He started from a womb. There wasn't this miraculous thing where he popped out of the heavens, no. If the worship team could come. He was born at a family's house. Right outside of that family's house. Because there was no room for him in there. There was no upper room because it had been filled with people with the census. 
So when the time came, Mary heard the cooing of a baby right outside with the animals. And he cried. <laughs> he cried like you and I would cry. There wasn't trumpets blowing with him. Those were happening in the field with the angels. No, he was cooing and he was crying and he needed to be held and he needed to feel warmth on his chest. He needed to hear his mother's voice. He needed to hear his adopted father's soothing sounds. Some mothers and fathers in this room know those feelings and those expressions and they are precious and they are humble. That is what that meaning of Philippians when Paul says that Christ humbled himself and became like you and I. And there wasn't going to be singing like we did tonight, that we're doing tonight. It was silent. It was precious. Oh, let it be God to use the simple things of this world to confound the wise. So what we're going to do is we're going to sing a song together. And as the candles become lit, Danny, if you would do me the honors in dimming the lights, and let's sing together to our Lord and Savior. God, we love you. Because on any other night, Lord Jesus, we would feel any other way. But tonight, there is a sense of peace in this place because you are here. And we are remembering your sacrifice to come here as a baby. I thank you for every man, woman, and child in this place. Let us not forget to remember you as you have remembered us. And that you've made us clean and pure. No longer depressed, anxious, worried for anything. Because you brought the answer. You are the answer. And we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. Well, we are going to blow out these candles. Danny, if you can bring up the lights. And we're going to sing one more song, what my senior pastor used to call the anthem of the Christian faith, joy to the world. <laughs> 